Please open your Bibles with me to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah that you have open before you is fiercely powerful. It will leave its mark on you. It will grab a hold of your heart with an iron grip and wrench it every which way. If you are in Christ, as you read these pages, your heart will mourn as you witness the rebellious nation of Judah in the last days, just before the city of Jerusalem is burned to the ground in charring ash and its people are chained and marched away into captivity. You will also grieve because you will recognize that the same sickness in them can be found inside of your very own heart. You will praise God with inexpressible joy because of his great mercy, both on his people Israel and for you who belong to his bride, the church of Jesus Christ. You will be strengthened and find courage as you see the lifelong account and example of the faithful prophet Jeremiah, a man who loved the Lord, a man aware of his inadequacy and beset with sorrow, yet called to stand against the world. He was both abandoned and persecuted by the people he loved, and you'll witness how the Lord fortified him and preserved him for 50 years of ministry during the death of a nation. You will rejoice in the yet future promises for the kingdom of Israel, who will one day stand as the shining jewel of the world and a witness for King Jesus, who is coming again to rule the earth from his throne with all power and authority in Jerusalem. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit that he might allow us to see a glimpse of his glory tonight. Almighty Lord, your living word is too powerful and too wonderful for us. It is too high. We cannot attain to it. What an astounding privilege to be at this stage of history where we get to behold the fullness of your revelation. We who are able to see the entirety and immensity of your plan from the fall in the garden to your glimmering throne in the new heaven and the new earth. What an immeasurable blessing to belong to Christ, to be rescued from slavery to sin and death, to become temples of the Holy Spirit and enabled to love and worship you because you first loved us. Such a great love that you had for your people that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, the God-man, the only acceptable sacrifice who would stand in our place and take our sin upon him and bear your wrath so that we might be pardoned and credited with his righteousness. Give us now the ability to behold your glory and the marvelous truths that you have given to us in the book of Jeremiah. Convict us of sin so that we might repent and lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and help us to run with all our might toward Christ. Enlarge our hearts to love and worship you more. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's begin tonight by examining the setting of Jeremiah. The majority of events that take place in this book occur during the reign of the last five kings of Judah, before the nation is conquered and taken into exile in Babylon. The book begins when the Lord first spoke to Jeremiah and called him into service during the 13th year of King Josiah's reign, which was in 627 B.C., Josiah was the last good king that Judah would have, and after leading the nation in a brief external reform, he died in a battle that took place during the power struggles of the nations at that time. After his death, there were only dark days remaining for the kingdom. The main contents of this book are the recordings of Jeremiah, calling for Judah to repent before they experience God's final judgment upon them. Tragically, they refused to listen and the nation of Judah would be overthrown only four short decades later. To give some perspective of when this book occurs on the historic timeline of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel had split into two kingdoms in 931 BC. After they divided, the northern kingdom was referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom was referred to as Judah. At the beginning of this book, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been conquered 95 years earlier and sent into captivity by Assyria, who was the world power of that time. The Lord had used the Assyrians to judge the north because of their great wickedness, and Judah had limped on, failing to learn from God's punishment on their northern brothers. But the hour had now come, 
for God to discipline Judah for their own unrepentant wickedness. They had failed to keep the requirements of the covenant, covenant he had made with them when he formed them as a people and brought them to, into the promised land 800 years earlier. By the te- time Jeremiah is called into service as the Lord's prophet, that area of the world was in a great uproar with different nations vying for control. The Assyrians' world dominance was waning and was finally overcome by the rise of the nation of Babylon. Not only had Babylon defeated Assyria, but they were on an unstoppable campaign to overthrow all the nations surrounding Judah. After failing to heed the Lord's warnings, he used the Babylonians to bring judgment on Judah, and as a result, they were ultimately conquered and exiled. Exiled to Babylon in three separate deportations. The final exile of 586 BC left Jerusalem burned to the ground, along with the temple that was meant to be the center of worship, sacrifice, and communion with God. All seemed lost. The faithful remnant in Judah had been waiting for the long-promised Messiah. The Lord had previously revealed that the Messiah would come from the descendants of King David and would rule from the throne in Jerusalem. How is that now possible if there is no king and no kingdom? But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a merciful and faithful God. And hope is never lost for those whom he loves. And when he makes a promise, the entire created universe will bow before his will so that it comes to pass. Before we dig into our text, let's have a very brief overview on the prophets of the Old Testament. The prophetic books of the Old Testament make up the largest portion of the Bible. If you were to take the prophetic books and pitch them between your fingers, from Isaiah to Malachi, you'll get an idea for just how much that is. These books are divided into two categories, which are commonly called the major and minor prophets. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets. The words major and minor are not speaking of how important or unimportant the books are, but instead is just referring to the size of the book. The prophets themselves were men appointed by God for the specific task of bringing his direct revelation to the people. They came from many different backgrounds in many different eras, but they came with a message And everyone from the king on the throne to the servant in the field was called to heed their words, knowing that their commission and their words were not their own, but came from God himself. When we think of the prophets, it's most natural to think of the foretelling of future events. They most certainly told of things to come. But the major portion of the prophet's job was foretelling. That is, they foretold the will of God. They were God's prosecuting attorneys, indicting the people for their wickedness, calling them to repentance and reminding them of their obligation to keep the stipulations of their covenant with God. The life of a prophet was hard. They were mostly mistreated, persecuted, and killed. These men are among the faithful that are spoken of in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. They were men of whom the world was not worthy. The prophet Jeremiah is currently standing among them in heaven. Faithful Jeremiah is himself the author of this book. His writings are both a mix of beautiful poetry and common everyday speaking style. At times, Jeremiah writes autobiographically, and in other places, he simply tells the story from an outside perspective. A trustworthy man named Baruch served as Jeremiah's scribe for this book, and he was also his loyal companion during specific seasons of ministry and sorrow. Let's take a look at the outline of the 52 chapters in this book. It's among the longest books in scripture, And some scholars consider this to be the longest book in the entire Bible, not by chapters, but according to the word count in the original Hebrew that it's written in. The book of Jeremiah could certainly be broken down into much more detail than we have here, but this layout gives the grand gist of its contents. In chapter one, we see the Lord commissioning Jeremiah to the work of speaking his divine words as a prophet. In chapters two through 45, we read of prophecies and all things concerning Judah. Remember that prophecies include both the revealing of future events and the proclaiming of God's truths and indictments. As you can see, this is by far the largest section of this book. In chapters 46 through 51, we actually get a glimpse of God's dealings with many nations that surround Judah. Chapter 52 stands on its own as a historical supplement and recap of Jerusalem's fall, And it also tells of a very intriguing event that takes place in Babylon once all is said and done. The material in this chapter can be found 
in a near identical passage in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. Chapter 52 of Jeremiah was likely added to show how his prophecies had come to pass as opposed to what the false prophets were proclaiming at that time. It's important to note that this book is not arranged in chronological order, but instead is arranged topically. This might sound intimidating, since sometimes in moving from one chapter to another, you'll discover that you're moving forward and backward in time during the setting of the book. But don't be discouraged by this or let it sway you from diving in. All scripture is God-breathed, and so you can be assured that there's a reason why the Holy Spirit ultimately had it arranged in non-chronological order. A good study Bible or commentary will help you in sorting out the changes in time. But be careful not to get too bogged down in trying to discern the arrangement of time among the chapters. Otherwise, you might just miss the most important thing, the message. So what is the ultimate message of the book of Jeremiah? The message of Jeremiah is Jeremiah's plea against the insanity of sin toward a holy, merciful, and sovereign God who will judge iniquity. We're going to take an in-depth look at specific passages dealing with Jeremiah the man, the insanity of sin, the inevitable judgment, of iniqui- the inevitable judgment on iniquity, and God's great mercy, but the entire book is permeated with God's holiness and the sovereignty of God. Just like our text jumps around in time, we also will not be following a chronological order. But first look again at the message of this book and notice that it doesn't just say a plea against the insanity of sin, but it specifically states that it's Jeremiah's plea. Jeremiah is such an inherent part of this book and we have so much we can learn from him that it's impossible to separate him from any part of it. Because of that, we must first start with the man himself and take a look at Jeremiah and his life. We're told in the opening lines of this book that Jeremiah was born into the line of priests in the town of Anathoth. The priests in the Old Testament were those who served in the temple, assisting with offerings and sacrifices. And the town of Anathoth was just a few miles northeast of Jerusalem. When God first speaks to Jeremiah, he refers to himself as a youth. It's uncertain exactly how old he was at this time, but most scholars assume he was around 20. Jeremiah was told by the Lord that he was never to marry or have any children, but this was actually a mercy to him. The Lord didn't want Jeremiah's family to have to be a part of the terror that would come, especially during the time when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem. Most likely, he also didn't want Jeremiah to have to be preoccupied with their safety along the way. It's details like this that make Jeremiah such a fascinating figure. As a matter of fact, we know more about Jeremiah than any other prophet in the Old Testament. His personality, his thoughts, and his his emotions are laid bare and raw before the Lord as he interacts with them and the rebellious people of Judah. Part of his personality is his natural timidness. We get a glimpse of this in his reluctancy to God's call as a prophet. From the very start, he tells the Lord that he's too young for such an assignment and he tries to get out of it. He's a humble man, aware of both the grandeur of the task he's been called to and his own inadequacies. What is this grand task, this mission he's been called to? Please turn with me to chapter one and we'll look at verse four, beginning at verse four. Chapter one, verse four. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. The Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So from before Jeremiah was even born, God had set him aside to be his prophet. 
Note that he's been given the authority to speak over nations, plural. We'll look into that later. And what will his words do? They will bring judgment, plucking up and breaking down, destroying and overthrowing. But something very, very interesting, one little line there that gives a glimpse of the mercy that God will also show. Jeremiah's words will also build and plant. That's the first glimpse of the mercy of God that we will see. But as you can also see, the bulk of his ministry is going to involve destruction and judgment. Not only would he be crying out in desperation for the people to turn back before it was too late, but he was aware that nobody was going to listen. The Lord actually tells him in chapter seven. He says to him, you shall speak all these words, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. You shall say to them, this is a nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God or accept correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. And not only would they not listen to a word he said, but they would turn on him for warning them. Jeremiah suffered more opposition than any other Old Testament prophet. The people actually plotted to murder him and even his own family deceived him. Listen to 12.6 as the Lord warns him. For even your brothers and the household of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Even they have cried aloud after you. Do not believe them, although they may say nice things to you. He was also accused of treason by the people for prophesying that destruction from Babylon was coming upon them. At times he was beaten, placed in the stocks for torture, he was imprisoned on different occasions, and even thrown into an empty and muddy cistern left for dead until the Lord sent a man to rescue him. As you can imagine, a life like that would take a toll on a man. And Jeremiah was only human. Such a life drove him at times to despair, but it also kept him dependent and clinging to the Lord with a white knuckle grip. He was a strong man of prayer and were able to read some of the communion that he had with the Lord. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's quite shocking to see how raw his emotions were when speaking to God. Turn with me to chapter 20, verse seven for an example of this. Oh Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say, I will not remember him or speak his name, speak any more in his name, then in my heart, it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in and I cannot endure it. For I have heard the whispering of many Terror on every side, denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall say, perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. Here's Jeremiah actually telling the Lord, you fooled me into getting into this mess. I'm done, I don't wanna do this anymore. And yet, I'm not able to quit. You won't let me. If I say I won't remember you or speak your words anymore, then you set my heart aflame. And it's harder to resist you than it is to endure the hatred of the people. And notice how he never ultimately lost his faith and trust in the Lord even though within this very passage, if we were, continue, if we were to continue reading, you would, you would see how he turns back to despair. When the Lord called Jeremiah to be his prophet, he had told him, do not be afraid of them, for I am with, them. I am with you to deliver you. I have made you today as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron and as walls of bronze against the whole land. To the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to the people of the land. But he also warned him, do not be dismayed before them or I will dismay you before them. And that is exactly what happened to Jeremiah. And the Lord had to call him back to repentance. In chapter 15, the Lord tells him that if he returns, he will be restored and stand before him again. 
And then he reconfirms his promises to strengthen and deliver him from the people. You see here that Jeremiah was just a mere man, no different than you or I. Yet despite all the hatred, abandonment, and persecution, he never stopped loving his people. He came to be known as the weeping prophet because of the agony he feels in his heart after being shown the devastation that awaits his nation because of their unwillingness to repent. Turn with me to chapter 9, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. If this seems a bit surprising for a prophet, consider that Jesus himself was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, who also shed tears for this same people hundreds of years later. One last aspect of Jeremiah, the man that we must draw specific attention to, and that's his prayer life. We've already gotten a glimpse of it, but there is much more. He trusted in the power of prayer and in the ability to intercede for his people. Three times, possibly even four by inference, the Lord actually tells Jeremiah to stop praying. Stop praying for this people. At one point he says to Jeremiah, even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me to intercede for the people, to petition for them, my heart would not be with this people Send them away from me, from my presence, and let them go. This is fascinating. Why would the Lord tell Jeremiah to stop praying? Well, because the Lord delights in answering prayer, and it is effective. What's amazing is that even though the Lord told him not to pray on several different occasions, we see that Jeremiah just couldn't help himself, and he kept on attempting to intercede for the people. So what happens to Jeremiah in the end? When the Babylonians burned Jerusalem to the ground, he was singled out and treated by honor from the enemies. King Nebuchadnezzar had given specific orders that no harm was to come to him. This was part of God's promise to deliver him. He was offered his freedom of choice to go wherever he wanted. If he desired to go to Babylon, he would be personally cared for by the captain of the king's bodyguard. But if he desired to stay in the land among the poor and the few that were allowed to remain, he could do that too. He loved his people and his land so much that he decided to stay there among the ruins of Judah. He was given rations and a gift by the king of Babylon, and he went on his way to regroup with the very few people who remained. After a series of events in continued rebellion, he was taken against his will by a disobedient band of people to Egypt. Even there, he continued to serve the people as a prophet. Scripture doesn't ultimately record what happened to Jeremiah, but one thing we can say confidently is that he is currently worshiping Christ in heaven. Can you not help but love Jeremiah? Do you not draw strength from hearing about his life? A common everyday man, no different than you or I, called to things that were beyond him. If you are in Christ, then you, like Jeremiah, were called by the Lord for things much greater than you. You were set aside for redemption, for the forgiveness of your sin, to be set free from slavery to sin and death, and to live for Christ. None of us are now called to be prophets, but we are called to be heralds and proclaimers of the good news. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, begging others on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Just like Jeremiah, pleading with people to turn to God and away from certain judgment. Are we not created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them? Just like he he prepared a particular, particular life for Jeremiah. Consider the particular good works that God created for you. We'll be doing different things at different seasons in our lives, but rest assured, wherever you find yourself now, this is one of those works. This is what you are called to at this moment. And as long as you are faithful and seeking to glorify him in your duties, then they are just as worthy as the task that Jeremiah was called to. And remember that we must cling to the Lord with a white-knuckle grip 
because without his strengthening, we will despair, just like Jeremiah did. Many of you also know what it's like to be shunned by your family, by old friends, by your coworkers, and yet could you ever stop loving Christ? Is there anyone or anywhere else you could go now that you know the one who has the words of eternal life? Trust in this word. Trust in his promises to you. Cry out to him to increase your faith. Know that you can do nothing without his enabling powder, power. Know that man can do nothing to your body except to kill your body and send you straight into the arms of Christ. Believe in the power of prayer and in intercession for others, just like Jeremiah did. Trust that God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That is the Holy Spirit of Christ within you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But we did not always believe such things, did we? You were once dead in your trespasses and in your sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, and they were no different in Jeremiah's day. Let's look at the insanity of their sin. Turn with me to chapter two, verse one. Chapter two, verse one. Here we see the Lord bringing a summary of accusations against Judah, laying before them their numerous, numerous sins. He begins by speaking of a sweet time in earlier years when his people were like a tender bride to him who once espoused love for him and he led them and provided for them and protected them. It reads, verse one, now the word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah, saying, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of the harvest, all who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. But it wasn't to last. Israel and Judah would forget the Lord and their betrothals, their covenant which they had made with him before entering the promised land. Look at verse six. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us out of, up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed where no man dwelt. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and good things, but you came and defiled my land, and my inheritance you made an abomination. So what are some of the great sins that Judah was guilty of? Chief among them was idolatry. Look at verse nine. Therefore I will yet contend with you, declares Judah, and with your sons I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has ever been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What's worse is that the leaders of the people were also involved in this. Read with me starting from verse 26. As the thief is shamed when he is discovered, so the house of Israel is shamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests and their prophets. You who say to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave me birth. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. But where are your gods which you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of cities are your gods, O, o Judah. But it wasn't just the leaders involved in worshiping other gods. 
Just listen to a passage in chapter seven that gives a glimpse of what this looked like among the common people. This was one of the times when Jeremiah was actually told not to pray for the people. As for you, do not pray for this people and do not lift up a cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me for I do not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven and they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Everyone practiced idolatry from the greatest to the least. Kings, princes, priests who had even placed idols in the temple, false prophets, fathers, mothers, and they even involved their little children by having them gather the wood. What is likely the most detestable thing of all, though, is yet another way that they involved their children in their idolatry. Turn with me to chapter 19, verse 4. Chapter 19, verse 4. Here's the Lord in the middle of speaking to Jeremiah. Because they have forsaken me and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices in it to other gods that neither they nor their forefathers nor the kings of Judah had ever known and because they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, a thing which I never commanded or spoke of nor did it ever enter my mind. What evil, what utter wickedness, burning your children to a false god. Do you see how the depraved hearts of men haven't changed in thousands of years? People are still murdering children today through abortion. Satan is behind this as well. Do you see how he hasn't changed his mission? But idolatry wasn't the full extent of Judah's wickedness. In rapid succession, listen to a list of their sins. Just listen. There were false prophets prophesying lies. The people practiced injustice with one another. They oppressed the foreigners among them. They oppressed the orphans and the, mid- and the widows. They were murderers, thieves, adulterers, and liars. Even the women who are usually the last to practice wickedness were full of vileness. They too had become depraved. And after the people had committed all of these evils, they would come and attempt to worship the Lord in the temple and think that because of their offerings that they were delivered from sin. Even though they worshiped false gods, they thought that they were safe because they were still worshiping the Lord. And when it came down to it, they actually denied it all flat out saying that they had committed no evil and were innocent. They never believed that God would actually bring judgment upon them, thinking they were immune from travesty because the temple of God was with them, because they were God's covenant people. But just in case destruction from Babylon did come, they decided at times to form alliances with even former enemies and they turned to Egypt and Assyria They turned to them for protection but refused to turn to their own God. And remember that they had even seen God's judgment on Israel in the north as that kingdom was conquered and sent into exile by the Assyrians. How could a people be so blind? How could a people live in such heinousness? How could they run forward to iniquity with such madness not believing that judgment for their sins would come? The monumental answer to this all is given to us in chapter 17, verse nine. Please turn with me there. Seventeen nine. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Keep your eyes on these words and let's examine them closely. We didn't just read that the heart is deceitful, but that the heart is more deceitful than all else, more deceitful than anything that exists. We didn't just read that the heart was sick, but that the heart is desperately sick. We're told that it's beyond comprehension, it's insanity. There is no one who can truly understand its depravity. This is the true nature of man. His heart is iniquitous. 
beyond anybody's ability to ascertain. It seeks out ways to commit evil, all the while deceiving him. Surely a just God must hold man accountable for such abominations. We are well aware at this point that God intended to discipline Judah for her unrepentant sins. But from the very beginning of Jeremiah's call, the Lord made it clear that he was sending invaders to conquer the land from another people. Let's read the accusations that the Lord brings before his people, indicting them for their failure to keep the stipulations of the covenant and pronouncing sentence upon them. Chapter 11 gives a helpful insight. This is a longer section that we're going to read, but it gives a greater picture of Judah's sin. Please turn with me to chapter 11 and we're going to begin in verse one. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not heed the words of this covenant which I commanded your forefathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, listen to my voice and do according to all which I command you. So you shall be my people and I will be your God. In order to confirm the oath which I swore to your forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is to this day. Then I said, amen, O Lord. And the Lord said to me, proclaim all these words in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers in the day that I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, warning persistently, saying, Listen to my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked each one in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought on them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Then the Lord said to me, a conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned their back to the iniquities of their ancestors. They have turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused to hear my words and they have gone after God, other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster on them which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they burn incense. But they surely will not save them in the time of, the, of their disaster. For your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah. And as many, as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars that you have set up to the shameful thing altars to burn incense to Baal. In this passage, we see that the Lord's patience with them has finally come to a close. They and their forefathers had forgotten their, the promises that they made to the, Lord, to the Lord. They turned from him and they stubbornly, stubbornly persisted in their evil ways, though warned repeatedly throughout the centuries. As the last four decades before the final destruction of Jerusalem wind down in this book, the people are given more and more detail as to the nature of their punishment. Just listen to how the Lord describes the enemy who will conquer them. Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It is an, an enduring nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open grave. All of them are mighty men. They will devour your harvest and your food, they will devour your sons and your daughters. They will devour your flocks and your herds. They will devour your vines and your fig trees. They will demolish with the sword your fortified cities in which you trust. As time passed on, it was made known to them that it was King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who would be the Lord's judgment upon them. Furthermore, they would be taken away into exile. The Lord had redeemed them from slavery in Egypt and they refused to be his people, so back into slavery they would go. The final siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar's army was in and of itself a nightmarish wrath of horror poured out upon the people. There was death, terror, famine, thirst, disease, murder, 
and even cannibalism. The most civilized among them degenerated into beasts. When the city wall was finally breached, Judah's cowardly king Zedekiah and his soldiers abandoned the people. Read with me this account from chapter 52, starting in verse 7. Then the city was broken into, and all the men of war fled and went forth from the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans were all around the city, and they went out by way of the Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath and he passed sentence on them. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he also slaughtered all the princes of Judah and Riblah. Then he blinded the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him with bronze fetters and brought him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. And I'm actually gonna skip, skip down just a bit here. Actually, we'll continue from verse 12. Now on the 10th day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard who was in the service of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every large house he burned with fire. So all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile some of the poorest of the people. The rest of the people who were left in the city, the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, and the rest of the artisans. It's painful to read about such things. The calamity upon a people who refused to love their God and the collapse of their nation but they needn't have been surprised by this devastation because the Lord had told them over 800 years ago before entering the promised land the curses that awaited them for breaking this covenant, even detailing the horrors that were described during the siege. What's even more painful to realize is that they continually slapped away God's open arms of mercy. God is indeed a God of mercy and it was abundantly given and offered until the very end. Let's look at that regal mercy in contrast to their judgment. Although much of the book of Jeremiah focuses on the great tragedy of Judah and the judgment they bring upon themselves, God's mercy oozes throughout every single page. Consider first, as we just heard, that this people had entered into a covenant agreement and they were fully made aware of its blessings for obedience and its curses for disobedience. The better part of a century had passed and God patiently withheld his judgment, although they had almost always been a disobedient people. He had sent them prophets and warnings repeatedly over the centuries, even to northern Israel before they were finally conquered and taken away. It was only by mere mercy that Judah was spared. Jeremiah himself was a mercy to this people From the time of his calling to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the Lord had given Judah roughly 40 years to repent. Jeremiah even told them that the Lord was willing to relent if only they would turn back from their sin. Early in his ministry, he stood at the gates of the temple and he yelled out, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Turn with me to chapter five, verse one, and hear what the Lord once said to Jeremiah about the people in Jerusalem. Chapter five, verse one. Roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and look now and take note, and seek in her open squares, 
If you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her. This is reminiscent of Abraham's intercession with the Lord when he agreed to spare Sodom if only 10 righteous people were found there. In the verse we just read, the Lord is surely speaking in hyperbole as we know that there's always a remnant of the faithful. And we're even aware of some by name in this book. But the idea is that he was willing to pardon Judah for an incredibly small number of faithful people. Consider that the mercy of the Lord was shown in that he sent Babylon to come, to come upon Jerusalem twice before it was finally destroyed in the fir- third and final exile. So each time, after witnessing their brothers and sisters being carried away, they had an opportunity for repentance. They had 19 years pass from the first exile to the third exile. 19 years after they had seen the prophecies of Jeremiah start to come true. When final judgment was imminent and Jerusalem lay under siege, the Lord offered mercy to his people yet again. Please turn to chapter 38 too and let's read what Jeremiah had to say to the people and to King Zedekiah in this final hour. Chapter 38, verse two. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city will die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Now skip down to verse 19 and see Jeremiah's interaction with the king who actually had the authority to order the people out. At this time, Jeremiah found himself imprisoned and the fearful king had secretly sent to him wanting to know if the Lord had told him what was going to happen. Starting at verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. This city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Tragically, as we've already seen, the king did not heed the words of Jeremiah. The Lord continued to give mercy to his people by having previously promised the captives that they would be returned to their land in 70 years. And while they were in Babylon, they would enjoy a measure of grace, being able to live fruitful lives, and they were instructed to seek the welfare of that place, praying for it and making it their temporary home. The Lord was also merciful to others besides Judah. Do you remember when the Lord first came to Jeremiah, he told him, I have appointed you a prophet to the nations? Well, Jeremiah did indeed prophesy to other nations. It wasn't just Judah who was going to be judged for sin because God is the ruler of all the people of the earth. All the kingdoms surrounding Judah were just as wicked as they were. The bulk of those prophecies are in chapters 46 and 51, but in chapter 27, we are told of a time during the beginning of Zedekiah's reign when there was a lot of messengers coming and going from the kingdoms around them. No doubt they were all collaborating, exchanging information, and possibly attempting to form alliances against the unstoppable Babylonian Empire. The Lord tells Jeremiah to send word back to these kings through their messengers that he is creator of all the earth. He was creator of men, he was creator of beasts, and by his great power, he will give to the world, he will give, he will give the world to whom he desires. And he has, in fact, given their lands to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He warns them not to raise, not to listen to their false prophets and not to fight against Nebuchadnezzar, otherwise they will die by the sword. They will also experience famine and disease. But if they submit to him, then they will be allowed to stay in their lands. Here is God showing mercy to a people who he had never known, a people who had never known him, a people he had no obligation to. Unfortunately, they do not listen and they were overthrown just like Judah. Is that all though? Surely no one can argue how vast and wonderful these mercies are. But yet, what would that change? 
Would the people and the nation cease to be wicked now that they had been overthrown? They had only proven time and time again the insanity of continuing to sin after they had been offered mercy upon mercy, knowing it would bring judgment. The Jews would indeed return to Jerusalem 70 years later, only to fall back into old patterns. Their rebelliousness would again rise into an unstoppable fury until they would murder their long-awaited Messiah, have their city burnt to the ground yet again, this time by the Romans, and sent into exile yet again. When will it stop? How can it stop? Has God finally forsaken the Jews? Is it hopeless? Hope is never lost for those whom he loves. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 and marvel at the greatest and most majestic mercy of them all, God's ultimate mercy toward the Jews and all mankind. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach, they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Hope is never lost for those whom God loves. In these grand verses, God has promised that he has not cast aside his people, that there will be a day when he makes a new covenant with them, one which they will be enabled to keep. He will provide the ability to be obedient. His law will be with them in their hearts in such a profound way that they will truly be able to know him as never before. Furthermore, their iniquity will be forgiven and he will remember their sin no more. The Lord goes on to say that these things are as sure as the order of creation. These promises are unbreakable. Between chapters 30 and 31, the Lord tells Jeremiah to write down some very comforting promises. He says that his people will be regathered to the land and experience blessings beyond measure. There will be such a peace, such a joy, and such an abundance into a, in addition to all, all that we've already read. These promises are also specifically tied to their land in Israel. These promises have actually yet to be fulfilled. This is a time which we've come to know, come to call as the millennial kingdom which will occur after the great tribulation, when Jesus comes back and reigns from his throne in Jerusalem. This is before the great white throne judgment and before the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And yet, some of the promises that we read here in the new covenant, new covenant are ve very familiar to us, aren't they? Although this specific time spoken of here is yet to come, is yet future, Jesus inaugurated the new covenant by his blood and the spiritual aspects of it are experienced by the church, by Christians, by Christ's bride. Turn to one last passage with me to see this magnificent truth. Romans eleven twenty five. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Gentile Christians in Rome. For I do not want you to know, for I, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. 
From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's grace, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient. That because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. As Paul says, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. But the question remains, how does this happen? How does a nation or even a person simply turn from a life of willful, hateful disobedience to God, refusing to serve him as their Lord? How can God simply forgive them? How could God simply forget their sins? How could God simply write his law on their hearts so that they know him? There's nothing simple about it. It's a miracle of miracles. It's an act of recreation. And it took the death of an innocent, innocent man, the God-man, Jesus. The root of the insanity of Judas' sin in the book of Jeremiah was their desperately sin-sick and deceitful hearts. But it's not just Judah. They, like all humanity, were born under the curse of death because we all share the original same parents, Adam and Eve. Just as father and mothers pass down their genetics to their child, so Adam and Eve passed down what was in them, death. When they disobeyed God in the garden, they died spiritually, and after that, their death spread to all men. And this is one and the same as the desperately sin-sick and deceitful heart. The heart causes the insanity of sin toward a holy, merciful, sovereign God who will judge iniquity. This is a heart that is incapable of anything but sin. It is incapable of knowing, loving, and glorifying God. Against God's holy standard, man has never done anything but sin. God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel to show them an example of God's pure and holy standard, and it was intended to make them realize that they were not capable of achieving the righteousness of God. But by God's standard, there is none righteous, not one, and the wages of sin is death. The penalty for death is in eternity and the lake of fire. Sin demands a payment. Can a condemned man, one who is already under the curse of death and sin, make that payment? He needs a substitute, one who could make that payment on his behalf. That substitute would need to be a man, but he would also need to be free from the curse of sin and death, and that's exactly what Jesus was. He was the God-man. That's why he needed to be born a virgin. He interrupted that line descended from Adam and Eve. He took on the flesh of a man because Mary was his mother, but he was born righteous and free from the curse of sin and death because God was his father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For those who would believe, he came and lived a perfect life of, of obedience to God in their place. And when the time came, Christ gave himself as a substitute for them. He was hung upon a Roman cross where a great transaction occurred. God the Father made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on their behalf so that they might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. God's wrath was poured out upon an innocent substitute. He died and was buried, but because he was sinless, the grave could not hold him. He conquered death for his people and he rose again. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and now lives to intercede for his people. And for those that by faith believe he paid their penalty, they received his righteousness just as he received their sin. They are given a new heart. They are recreated. They are born again. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, comes to live within them. Their new heart is now capable of loving and glorifying God. They are now reconciled to God and are forgiven their sins, alive in Christ. If you are in Christ, if you have been forgiven your sins, then you love these truths just as much as you love your Savior, Jesus. Rejoice and worship him. Give praise to God that you now have the Spirit of Christ living within you. But you need to be very careful. You need to understand that just because we have been given new hearts doesn't mean that we are not still under the ability of sin to deceive us. 
It is no longer our master, but it does seek to deceive us. All the way from the beginning of creation until the, the great white throne, people will continue to rail against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's astounding to think that at the very end of John's ministry, when he wrote to his people, one of the last words he said in 1 John 5, 21, he said, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Why would he need to say such a thing? Why would he need to tell Christians to guard themselves from idols? You see how the people of Judah were so, so given to, to worshiping false gods. And even Christians, even us, we can be tempted to go after other things, things which will not satisfy, things which will not bring the righteousness of God in our lives. So what do we do with that? How do we, how do we grow in that? The only way that you can is through this. Renew your mind in the word. Bathe yourself in this. Ask God to open his scriptures to you and it will sanctify you. Believe and trust that this is living and active and, and pray and ask for help in these things. Glorify him. Rejoice that now that you have, the whole, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The people in the Old Testament, they used to have to go to a temple to offer sacrifices. You now are that living sacrifice. You now are able to worship God and give him offerings in all that you think, do, and say. Rejoice in that. Remember that. If you are not in Christ, if you do not know this Lord, you need to know that you are under the same insanity of sin that the people of Judah were. You still have that same sinful heart inside of you that is in need of recreation. You are in need of being born again. Christ has paid the penalty for all those who will trust in him and believe that he died on their behalf to trust in your own works, to trust that he will allow you to remain with him for all of eternity based on what you have done in this life is madness. It's insanity. He, said he has provided a robe of righteousness for his people, something that they could not do. And to come to him with dirty rags and expect him to receive that, it's insanity. It's insanity. Turn tonight. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. See the mercy of God. Do you think that he will reject you? Do you think that he will be angry with you? He is ready to run to you. He is ready to throw his arms around you. He is ready to love you. He will give you the ability to love him. Turn aside from your sin and trust in him. Please join with me as we close in prayer. Holy Father, only you were capable of the genius of preparing such a plan to rescue sinful humanity. You loved us when we were your enemies. You loved us when we were content to go our own way. You loved us so much that you sent your son to come and die on our behalf. Lord, we could never repay you but we love you, we worship you, we desire to live our lives for you. Father, we pray that you would just give us the ability to keep you at the center of everything in our lives. Let our lives be a complete and utter devotion to you. Everything we think, everything we say, everything we do, may it be pleasing in your sight. We thank you for the book of Jeremiah and the many wonderful truths found in it. And we pray these things in the holy name of Christ. Amen.